more ushered in in this particular century the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Not that it wasn't there, it's always been there, but at certain times and periods of history, there's a silence. But I think it's significant because I believe that God wants to use the black man even today in the final end time revival so that we will be smack dab in the middle of what he's getting ready to do. There was a young man named C.H. Mason, an elder C.H. Mason, who went there to receive something. You remember the story. He was in part of a Charles Price Jones, a tremendous tandem. Uh, back in 1897, 1895, they hooked up together. 1897, they formed the Church of God in Christ. It was not incorporated really then. And uh, Mason went to California. He received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What a wonderful experience. Acts 2 and 4 with evidence of speaking in tongues. Anybody here still believe in the Holy Ghost? Now the Holy Ghost is more than speaking in tongues. We believe that speaking in tongues is the initial evidence that one has it. It's not the Holy Ghost because when you get to shoot, the tongue comes with it. So what we're really saying here is the evidence that one has it. If you just emphasize the tongue, some people will be cussing and lying and speaking in tongues and think they got the Holy Ghost. You may have had it, but you lost it. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost gives one the ability to live safe, stay safe, and also become an effective witness. Because the Bible says in Acts 1 and 8, but he shall receive power after that with the Holy Ghost come upon you. Well, what happened, Zion? We lost a whole lot of this power. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So Bishop Mason, Charles Mason at that time, goes back uh, to his area. And there's a problem with C.P. Jones, because C.P. Jones, again, him, he did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they split. They split that in 1907. There was a big convention, and uh, Bishop Mason won out, and then the courts gave him the right to incorporate the Church of God in Christ. We need to understand this history to understand where we were, where we are, and where we are going. C.P. Jones uh, then formed a church, the Church of Christ Holiness. But what's so significant about this is that our church has grown to millions, and his church is still very, very small. As a matter of fact, this November, at the Hyatt Regency in Dearborn, they will be having their convention. You don't hear much about them. You can't even name who the leader of their church is. Their church has not succeeded. It has not grown. I just got to read that Charles Harrison Mason had it right. <laughs> but I got any witnesses to thank you. And we're all over the world. He said the son would never settle the church of God in Christ. I mean, you know that it's true. He was a true prophet of God. So he believed we know only not to be saved as a second act of grace. We're sanctified. You're saved. And then you learn how to live saved, sanctified, set from the world to God. You're not immediately perfect, but you learn how to live holy. And then you don't stop at being saved and being sanctified. There's another thing. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Oh, bless you. You know to get it on the inside of you. If you get it on the inside, you know how to live right. And you'll have some power. You'll have some power to heal the sick. That's why I stand tonight in authority and say, let the sick be healed. I didn't ask the devil to come out of anybody. Come on out! We got some power. We got some authority. We can speak it because God has given it to us. And so we noticed something about our church. In the early days of our church, we primarily in Arkansas and Mississippi and Tennessee. That's where blacks primarily were. We were this lower socioeconomic group. Most of us were poor. Most of us were the down and outers. We were in a agrarian society. We worked on the farms. And people laughed at us. You got to understand something. We were not highly educated. Uh, we had to brush arbors with new arbors. And then we went to the storefronts. And some of y'all don't know anything about storefronts. We've always been in buildings like this. We've always had the Harris Memorials and these beautiful churches that God has blessed us. But we thank God for our heritage. None of us young men will ever get inside ourselves and think that we uh, started this thing and that we've been blessed because we are we stand on the shoulders of our pioneers who made a way for us. And I thank God for those pioneers. They couldn't build a church like we built because they didn't have the opportunity. But thank God he's been good to us. But we notice what God did for us. I believe that we had the right doctrine and Bishop Mason had the right plan for this, this church. And because of that, the gospel was disseminated all over. But something began to happen because people began to leave the South and go north. The Industrial Revolution, 1917. We migrate to the South. We come to Michigan. Notice what is happening. You're going to see something. Notice what happened. The people come. They come to Detroit. They come to Pontiac, Flint, and Saginaw. Get jobs in generous motors. Uh, I mean, <laughs> 
generous Moses becomes our God. And all of a sudden, uh, we get a little blessing. Some of us, you know, we get a nickel above the expense and you can't touch us. When you was broke, flat, and busted, you get to church every time the door was open. You even fast and pray twice a week, every Tuesday and Friday. Now they tell you to fast two and Friday. You say, why we got to fast two and Friday? Well, the fact of the matter is, Bishop Mason said all over the world, we'll fast every Tuesday and Friday. The people of God coming together, worldwide fasting. In unity, there is strength. You don't believe in Tuesday and Friday, nor do you believe on Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Well, this was a great church. This was a great church. We became a great church because, because we believed in shadians. We prayed. If you fast, you last.